to from Algren is the chief scientist of Gavagai, a startup that develops scalable and efficient distribution of semantic models to various real world and natural language processing tasks. Uh, Salgren has been a senior researcher at the Swedish Institute for Computer Science for 10 years and is an expert on random indexing, hyperdimensional computing, and world space exploration. He is the author of several scientific publications on natural language processing. And, and now we are going to uh, see what he can teach us, I hope, uh, a lot of new things about uh, distributional semantics. So, welcome our speaker. Okay, you can start. Sorry. You can start with the web and I'm just thinking what you put as a lot of things. So when we, uh, when you want to start, just tell us what we need. You can organize each web. Okay. 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 Very, very good. Um, so it, it is a little bit weird to have these kind of web seminars because uh, uh, I can't see you and <laughs> I get no feedback. Uh, so it's like having a monologue for like three hours. Uh, so my plan was to actually have, have a break um, and the structure of the, the talk will be uh, quite natural to have a break in, in the middle. And I'll also try to, to pause in between to take questions. So usually I like to encourage questions all the time, but since we can't really interact, I think it's better to save up questions uh, during the talk. So, so that's the plan. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, my plan with this lecture uh, was to first give you um, sort of a general um, introduction to, to what is distributional semantics. Since I don't really know the background of everyone there, I think it's good that we have a common uh, ground, a common framework in terminology when we talk about these models. Um, so I'll introduce the basics um, and repeat some of the basic concepts and uh, go through the basic types of models and also talk a little bit about the type of information that we can expect to get out of these models. Um, and also walk you through some hands-on steps on how to actually build these models. Um, and then uh, the plan was to have a short break, just for me to keep sane. And then we'll um, continue after the break talking about distributional semantics and big data. And in particular, I, I'm going to focus on random indexing, uh, which is... Uh, computational framework for building distributional semantic models applied to big data. Um, I should also say that, uh, as Piero mentioned, I'm, I'm currently with a company called Gavagai. Uh, one of the things that we do here is building uh, models that are, that are based on distributional semantics for very large data sets. Um, so, so this is really something that we do every day. And I'll talk a little bit about, um, at the end of the talk, some of the problems and solutions that we uh, encounter doing that. Right. Um, so before I actually start talking about distributional semantics and the models, I thought it would be good to sort of motivate why we are interested in these types of models. Um, and we're dealing with natural language uh, and uh, in an application-oriented uh, scenarios that we are often confronted with situations where we are, uh, where we need to quantify similarities between entities in, in language. And often it would be beneficial if these similarities could be semantic in nature. Uh, this is applicable to most, uh, if not all, language processing task. And you can maybe think about if you can come up with a counterexample of a language processing task that would not be, uh, that would not be uh, benefited by including this type of similarities. And of course examples um, are, are several, 
information retrieval, of course, information filtering, which is a very similar task. Uh, where we are uh, dealing with similarities between queries and documents, or between documents and documents. Um, also machine translation, of course, is a very good example of this. Text categorization, where the task is to um, categorize or cluster uh, a set of documents. We also have seen a, a recent surge of interest in uh, sentiment analysis and opinion mining. Um, where usually the task is defined as trying to infer the semantic orientation of a piece of text or an utterance. Uh, and of course, we often are interested in doing that on social media data, which has a little bit different characteristics from traditional data sets. And we'll come back to that uh, later on. Speech processing is, of course, also another example where, where we really have similarity computations as a, as a, basic, uh, as a basic characteristics of the task. And in all of these, um, it would be assumed that including semantic knowledge would be beneficial in some way uh, to enhance performance. And uh, one path that we might want to take uh, for doing this is to use existing lexical resources. And there are, of course, a number of those available. I'm guessing you all know about WordNet, and you have probably used it also, um, which is, of course, a very big and very nice database in English. Uh, there are several other types of thesauri or uh, ontologies and, and similar uh, resources like WordNet available. Um, so one potential issue with using these resources uh, is that they tend to be either very general uh, with, with sort of a focus on, on general language use or they tend to be very domain specific and tailored for a specific task and domain. And that, of course, might be a problem if you have an application scenario where your domain switches uh, very fast. So it, it would be very expensive to have a, a staff of, of human experts that need to compile a new resource every time you, you encounter a new domain. Uh, so this might be a problem. Of course, also, uh, pre-compiled lexical resources contain uh, a number of a priori assumptions uh, about language use and, of course, also the human analyst's bias uh, on language use. And we know that when dealing with social media, uh, in particular, that language use is very productive. People really reinvent language all the time there. Um, also, of course, this type of existing resources uh, really have trouble dealing with new words uh, because they are simply not in the resource. So, and, and that also happens frequently dealing with, with uh, especially social media data. People come up with new terms all the time. And if it's not in the resource, then we're really stuck there. Uh, same problem uh, is, of course, surface variations. Like uh, spelling errors or uh, spelling variants. And we'll see some fun examples of what this can look like in social media data later on. Another problem is, of course, that these lexical resources are typically monolingual. Um, and that's, uh, that's, of course, fine if you're dealing with only language, uh, English language data. But uh, for, for less resource-strong languages, and that includes even languages like Swedish. Um, there are no big lexical resources. And the situation is, of course, even worse for, for, for languages like Amharic or something like that. Um, so all of these factors together uh, point to the need for us to devise methods for automatically estimating semantic similarities from data. Um, so there is really a need for us to have data-driven methods here. And distribution of semantics uh, from this perspective is really a, an answer to, to this question. And this is the motivation uh, for why we're interested in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very application-oriented myself. Uh, I think that these models are interesting because they uh, help us deal with concrete issues and they are useful in processing tasks. <clears throat> 
Right, so distributional semantics, um, if we try to define that then, uh, the, the idea is that we want to be able to quantify semantic relations based on distributional information. And when I say semantic relations here, I mean, that, that can mean many things. Uh, people typically have their own uh, interpretation of what is semantics. And what we mean by that in this particular context is uh, um, paradigmatic relations. And uh, I think there are some linguists uh, listening here now, and, and you know what paradigmatic relations are. And perhaps there are some computer science students that maybe don't know what paradigmatic relations are. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a second. Um, but before I do that, I want to clarify what distributional means here. And distributional information means simply co-occurrence statistics. So by looking at how words co-occur together, we can infer their paradigmatic relations. That's the idea. So what is paradigmatic relations? Well, paradigmatic relations, uh, it's a technical term in linguistics, um, and it's defined as holding between terms or entities uh, that, well, don't co-occur together, but they co-occur with the same other words. So we can also call this a substitutional relationship. So uh, words that have a paradigmatic relation can be substituted for each other in context. Um, so there are several examples of paradigmatic relations. Uh, one example, and perhaps the best example of, of paradigmatic uh, relationships, are synonyms. So words like good and great that mean the same or at least very similar things. Um, they can be substituted for each other in context, and they occur together with the same other words. So you can say, this was a really good lecture, or this was a really great lecture. So good and great occurs in the same contexts. Um, however, we also find antonyms uh, as a paradigmatic relation. And these, uh, these are words that don't mean the same thing, but mean the opposite thing. So you can say, this was a really good lecture. You can also say, this was a really bad lecture. So good and bad will uh, occur in the same context. And the same goes for hypernyms, which is, uh, um, well, the hypernym is a more general term than its uh, hyponym. So animal is a hypernym of dog. And I guess living entity would be a hypernym of animal. And perhaps entity would be a hypernym of living entity. So it's a hierarchical relationship. And the other way in the hierarchy is a hyponym then. So, so dog is a hyponym of animal, and poodle is a hyponym of dog. And well, I don't know what there are hyponyms of poodle, but I'm, I'm guessing there are subcategories of poodles too. Um, and there are other types of names also. Uh, Meronymy is a part uh, whole uh, relationship. So finger is a part of a hand, etc. And now, the, 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 the nice thing here is that the traditional lexical semantic relations uh, uh, are the paradigmatic relations. So, uh, when we use co occurrence statistics to acquire paradigmatic relations, we are really getting at uh, semantic relations, at least as we define them in, in uh, lexical semantics. Okay, so the underlying idea here is something that has been um, referred to as the distributional hypothesis. And if you read papers on distributional semantics, you, you will see um, several different uh, formulations of this hypothesis. Um, but the core idea is something like this, that if we find words with similar distributions, then we can assume that they have similar meanings. And as we, we have seen, um, distributions uh, are really cool current statistics and meanings are really paradigms. Uh, so another way of putting the distributional hypothesis is to say that well, words that co-occur with the same other words belong to the same paradigm. That's the distributional hypothesis. Um, and uh, you will also see references to, to people who have 
who have claimed this hypothesis. And I don't think there really has been, uh, I think this hypothesis emanates from, from the field of distributional semantics. There was no linguist previously that really stated this particular distributional hypothesis. But the, the theoretical origins of this is quite clear. It's, it's based in uh, structuralism and more particularly in American structuralism. Um, Leonard Bloomfield and Selig Harris are perhaps the most obvious origins of this type of ideas. Harris uh, was, of course, the, the one who, who uh, uh, pretty much invented the distributional methodology, uh, or at least made it very popular. Um, and Harris is often cited as the origin of the distributional hypothesis. And, uh, that might not be entirely true. He was definitely the inspiration for, for this type of research, but he didn't really claim uh, what, what we see on the slide here. Uh, but uh, American structuralism and, and uh, the distributional ideas of Selig Harris is the theoretical origins of, of very much of what we assume about language here. Just as a curiosity, Selig Harris, for those of you who don't know, uh, him, uh, well, he's, he's passed away now, but he used to be uh, Chomsky's teacher. So he was really the sort of uh, the origin also of Chomsky's ideas. Okay. Now, uh, so this whole idea about using current statistics to get that lexical semantic relations, that really makes sense from a linguistic perspective. We have a nice theoretical uh, foundation for this. Um, and we can build our models, and they will uh, they will work uh, pretty much ex ex as uh, expected from a linguistic perspective. But of course, we may also ask, since we're dealing with semantics and meaning here, do they make sense from a cognitive perspective? So the meanings that uh, I attach to words uh, are they can they be described as purely paradigmatic relations? Um, and of course, there are some obvious facts here that we can point to. So we, as humans, we obviously can learn new words based on contextual clues. And of course, this, this happens um, every day when we read the newspaper. We encounter a new word and uh, we sort of infer what it means based on the context. And we can see things like this. Um, and, and you can all sort of imagine what a wapimuk must be just based on this, uh, on this sentence here. And if we encounter a new occurrence of this word, but now it seems that we have uh, an instance of polysemy here, right? So this word really means two different things in, in these different contexts. And this is no problem. Um, and this uh, is also a very significant feature of just normal uh, discourse. So it frequent, frequently happens that you encounter a new word when you talk to someone, but you very rarely uh, stop the conversation and say that, oh, wait a minute, I, I need a definition of this word. You sort of pretend that, like nothing happened and you hope to infer the meaning based on uh, some other occurrence of the word. Uh, and that happens all the time. And that's sort of how language use works. So obviously contextual cues has a role to play in the formation of, of word meaning. But then, of course, we have examples like this. OK, so one of the things that are very predominant in, the, in my cognitive representation of the word banana is the color of the banana and the banana shape. And it turns out that uh, it's so predominant that people very rarely talk about yellow bananas, because yellow is assumed uh, in the concept of a banana. So if the banana would be red, I would definitely say that it's a red banana. But if it's a yellow banana, I don't need to, to talk about the color being yellow. And if we train our model, and there has been some very nice uh, experiments and, and demonstrations of these effects by, well, for example, by Marco Baroni, uh, fellow Italian, and Alessandro Lenzi. Uh, they have pretty much demonstrated that uh, relationships based on distributional semantics don't really uh, uh, correspond to association norms, where people might produce, for example, yellow as an association for banana. But of course, a distributional semantic model 
would only uh, be able to acquire knowledge from text data. And if people very rarely talk about uh, yellow bananas, then we really don't have a chance to capture this type of relation. So um, there might be some interest in also including extra linguistic context, uh, for example, based on image information. And these are very interesting paths of research. Uh, people have just began to traverse these paths, and uh, it will be interesting to see how far we can get here. Um, I'm quite sympathetic of this type of research, but it should be noted that um, this marks one step away from the uh, original distributional hypothesis then, because that was from a uh, formulated from a purely structuralist perspective. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. Okay, so the distributional hypothesis is the theoretical foundation of uh, distributional semantics. And I think that this is a good time to take questions on, on the theory and about the distributional semantics ideas. So, so I'll let you Think about if you have any questions, and we can take them now. Okay, is there someone with, that wants to ask some questions? Okay, no one. So I assume that everyone is completely <laughs> confident with, and you explain it really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, very good. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue then, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the representational framework of distributional semantics. And this is, uh, this is the generalization, so, so we're talking about the most common type of representational framework, which is vector space models. Uh, there are other types of models out there, but it's uh, the very much most common one is vector space models. And I'm really not sure about your background in mathematics, so I, I, my plan was to really go through this in detail. If you already know about vector spaces, you can uh, close your eyes for just a few mo moments, and I'll tell you when to wake up. So what you see here is a vector space. Um, it's defined by two dimensions, x and y, and we have two vectors, a and b. So vector a is defined by the coordinates 4 on the x-axis and 3 on the y-axis. And the vector b is defined by two coordinates, 5 on the x-axis and 6 on the y-axis. So a and b can be seen as points in this vector space. Or if we uh, imagine a line from Origo, the zero point, then there are directions in this space. So this is a two-dimensional vector space. Now, uh, we, we represent these vectors a and b as lists of numbers, 4 and 3, and 5, five and 6. Um, and these uh, numbers, uh, they indicate uh, the value for each dimension. So we have two dimensions here, x and y. If we collect these vectors together, what we get is a matrix. So this is a two by two matrix. It contains two rows and it contains two columns. The rows are the vectors for A and B. The columns are the coordinates for the vectors of the two dimensions. Okay. So this is a vector space. And this can be generalized, of course, to any uh, any dimensions in, in both uh, directions. So this is an m times n matrix. It contains m number of rows, it contains n number of columns, and each cell in the matrix is defined by its coordinate uh, in the row and the column. Okay. So this is just uh, to get you uh, to get you used to the representation of a matrix, because we'll use that now. Okay, so let's talk about distributional semantic models that are based on, on vector space representations. And there are several different terms for this that are being used. Um, some people call it word space models, some people call it semantic space models. Uh, there are other terms like semantic vector spaces or latent vector spaces. Um, and I think that um, 
from now on, I will try to use the term distributional semantic model for these type of models. Um, and I think that this quote by Henry Schütze is very nice. It, it defines really the essence of these models. So vector similarity is the only information present in word space. Semantically related words are close, while unrelated words are distant from each other. And um, this is taken from one of Schütze's papers, which was actually called Word Space, uh, which he published in 1993, uh, which is one of the uh, most influential papers in this field. Uh, Schütze published a number of, of very influential papers around the 92 and 93, uh, which pretty much spawned the entire research area. And he also included this uh, nice picture here. And this is really a distribution of semantic model. This is the result that we want to arrive at when we have counted our co-occurrence statistics. And I'm not sure if you can actually read anything here, but in the middle of the slide there you have uh, IBM, and you have supercomputing, and then in the upper right corner you have Microsoft there. Um, and, and, and our interpretation of this would be that, okay, IBM is closer to supercomputing than Microsoft is. So maybe IBM and supercomputing have much more to do with each other than Microsoft and supercomputing. Okay, so, um, and this is it's a very intuitive way to deal with the similarities. Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, cognitively motivated. We generally talk about similar things being close to each other and these similar things being far from each other. So this is the, the idea that we want to arrive at. Okay, so the two very basic notions that we uh, want to talk about here uh, are, uh, first of all, uh, co-occurrence matrix and then a distribution of vector. And if you only remember five things from this lecture, you should remember uh, these two terms at least, co-occurrence co matrix and distribution of vector. And we'll talk in detail about what that means. So a co-occurrence matrix, that's a matrix. <laughs> and you have already seen uh, this matrix. It's a M times N matrix, contains M rows and contains N columns. Now, when we build our matrix based on uh, natural language data, we typically represent the word types as the rows. So it will contain M rows, and the number of M would be the size of the vocabulary. So, and this is an important point then. The words we talk about here are the word types. It's not the word tokens. So it's not every occurrence of the word red and car, it's just one occurrence of red and car here. And we collect all the co-occurrence information for the word, that particular word type in this vector. The columns are simply the contexts in the data, whatever context means, and we'll come back to that uh, in just a second. So we have all the contexts that we have in the data, and it's n number of contexts, so we have n number of columns. Uh, and then we populate this matrix by indicating co-occurrence frequencies. So the, the matrix will look something like this when we have populated it. And that means that for, for the row, for W1, which is word number one, you see that it has a zero in the first dimension there, which simply means it does not occur in the context number one, but it has a number one in the second dimension, and that means the word has occurred one time in context number two, etc. This is what we want to arrive at. Um, and the point of representing our data like this is that the rows can now be interpreted as vectors, and they will be n-dimensional. They will have as many dimensions as the number of contexts in the data. Um, and we will call these vectors distributional vectors, because they contain distributional information. Okay. So the point of all this representational stuff is that words that occur in the same contexts will get 
very similar distribution of vectors. Okay, so you see that word number one and word number three both occur in context number two and in the last context there. So they will have quite similar values on these dimensions. So this is the heart of, of all these type of models. And of course, the million dollar question here is what is a context? How do we, do we define context? Um, and there are really two different types of, of models here. The first type is a words by region type matrix. So in this model here, we have our vocabulary as rows. Um, so we have words like drink and coffee and other words. And then as the columns, we have some sort of text region. These models uh, originate in the field of information retrieval, and uh, in that field, a natural um, text region is called document. So, for example, we have words and we have documents. Uh, but, of course, the regions can be anything. It can be a paragraph. It might even be a sentence or a phrase. Uh, so, if we imagine, just for this toy example here, that uh, region number two is the, the sequence I drink coffee, then we would indicate that drink and coffee occur one time in this region. So we enter a one in dimension number two for drink and coffee. And then we populate the matrix by noting each occurrence in each region for the word. So that will lead us to uh, a representation where words that co-occur in the same region will get similar vectors. Uh, and of course, this is not really paradigmatic similarity as we have uh, talked about before. Now we're actually getting at something we would like to call maybe topical similarity or maybe even syntagmatic similarity. And for those of you who don't know what syntagmatic means, uh, it simply means um, things that occur in sequence. So I and drink and coffee represents a syntagmatic relationship. Um, and the difference between topical and syntagmatic similarities, we, we can say that syntagmatic similarity is more local. It holds between words that really co-occur together. Whereas topical similarity would be something that holds between words that occur in the same sort of document. So if I would continue this text region, I drink coffee and maybe I drink tea and then maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, well then coffee and tea would have a topical relationship there maybe. Okay. Um, the most um, well-known type of words by regions model is something called latent semantic analysis. Uh, it's also called latent semantic indexing, um, uh, LSA or LSI. Uh, just a clarification of, of this uh, terminology issue here. LSI is typically uh, the name when it's used in information retrieval and when it's used in cognitive science and, and computational linguistics we typically call it LSA for some reason. Um, and the idea here is that we start out with just a normal words by document matrix as we saw in the slide before. That's also called a typical vector space model and in information retrieval. So we have an M times N matrix, which is defined by the vocabulary and the number of documents in the data. Some specific things about LSA is that the raw frequencies in this matrix is transformed using uh, normally uh, an entropy-based weighting scheme, which is uh, the frequency of a term in a document. And usually what we do is we, we take the log of that. And in order to avoid zero uh, values, we take TF plus one and take the log of that. And then we divide that by the row entropy for that word. Um, there are many formulations of these type of weighting schemes. Um, and also in LSA publications, you will see several different uh, weighting schemes. And this is really one of the parameters that can be optimized in, in LSA. You can try out different weighting schemes and you'll maybe be able to uh, increase the performance a little bit. 
But uh, this formulation is from one of the first publications of LSA. So it's, it's typically a way, uh, uh, way, weighing by row entropy. And then another important aspect of LSA is that we take our co-occurrence matrix and then we transform it by something called uh, truncated singular value decomposition. Uh, I will not go into the math mathematical details of SVD here, but uh, I think it will be enlightening to at least see the result of this. So, so we'll go through what happens in the SVD. We'll ignore the underlying maths. Uh, but just to mention what, what is actually going on here. So singular value decomposition is something called the matrix factorization technique, which is simply a, a statistical method where you take a matrix and you... Um, uh, factorized it into several different sub-matrices. And in the case of SVD, we have three different sub-matrices, U, S, and V in this notation, where U contains the original rows, uh, and S is a matrix uh, containing something called singular values. V is uh, a matrix containing information about the original columns of the matrix. And by uh, by multiplying these submatrices together, we arrive at our at our standard uh, co-occurrence matrix. And the idea is that if we delete dimensions in the uh, factorized matrices, then we can arrive at an approximation of the co-occurrence matrix. And we look at exactly how how this can look like, because you'll be able to see the results and, and understand why people want to use this. So this is our, an example of our words by documents matrix, and this is uh, an example that is very typical in LSA literature. I stole it from uh, one of the first publications of LSA, because I think it's so nice. Uh, so here you have a word space model. Uh, you have words as the rows, and you have uh, the columns are documents in the data. And there are something uh, highlighted here. So the first row up there are, uh, or is the word human, and it has occurred one time in document number one and one time in document number four. And then you also see a highlighted row below, which is user. And if you look at the co-occurrence counts there, you see that user and human does not occur together in any document. And in the last document, you also see you have survey and trees, where survey occurs, but not trees. Okay. Um, and now, this comes from the information retrieval community. So a problem here, if you have this vector space model and you want to search for documents, um, and you get a query that contains the word user, then probably documents that contain human would be interesting for you because human and user might be considered to be synonyms, or at least related terms. But as you see in this vector space model, you would not retrieve any documents containing the word human if you only search for user. And this is called the synonymy problem in information retrieval. And LSA was designed in order to deal with that. So we'll see what happens when we do the SVD. So the SVD looks uh, like this. Uh, if so we do an SVD of, of this co-occurrence matrix, we, we get these sub-matrices. And the U matrix there contains uh, the original rows of the data, and the V contains the original columns. And then we have the S diagonal S matrix, which contains something called singular values. And the singular values pretty much describe the amount of variation in each of these um, dimensions here. So, uh, what we can do when we use the truncation of this uh, factorization is that we only retain the first dimensions of this factorization. And that means that we only retain the highest amount of variance in the representation. So we throw away everything that is low variance here. And if we do that, and we reconstruct our co-occurrence matrix only based on the first two dimensions, this is what happens. So now you can see that the vector for the word human and the vector for the word user have become a bit similar to each other. So now if you would actually search for documents using the term user, you would actually retrieve documents that also contain only the word human. And this is a very nice effect in an information retrieval system. 
You also see the word trees have now been induced into the last document there. And for people who are not uh, used to SVD and, and maybe have not uh, encountered this type of factorization before, this might seem as magic. Uh, I'm not sure what your reaction to this is, but it has a very simple explanation. And it's simply the fact that the word human co-occurs in the same documents as the word computer in this uh, matrix. And you see that the word user also co-occurs in the same documents as the word computer. So what happens when you do the truncation of the SVD is that you induce these second order relationships. It's sort of like saying that we don't really trust the co-occurrence information in the first matrix, so let's just somehow smear the co-occurrence values over the entire matrix, and then we'll get a better approximation. And that's why it's called latent semantic analysis. So the idea here is that when we do the truncated SVD, we uncover the latent or the true semantic relationships in the data. Obviously, very useful to use in information retrieval and in a vector space model when we have a words by documents matrix. Um, and of course, the, the, uh, the, uh, the type of similarities that we uh, have here uh, are with topical similarities between, because words that co-occur in the same documents are about the same topic. Well, at least this is a very significant assumption in information retrieval that documents are like topical unities discussing one topic. Um, so if you, for example, have this entire lecture as a document, you will see that words like document and distributional would be about the same topic. Uh, and what happens when we do the truncated SVD is that we're inducing higher order relationships, um, which we could say uh, is a way of approximating paradigmatic relationships. And again, I'm coming back to this fact that this is very useful if we deal with the words by documents matrix. Then if we're interested in term similarities, this is a very useful way of arriving at them. Um, but of course, there are many other probabilistic formulations of this type of, of model. And LSA has been a very popular method for a long time now. And people have been uh, refining and trying to improve on the, the baseline model uh, by adding a probabilistic framework for this. Uh, there is a model called probabilistic latent semantic analysis, or PLSA, that was the first model that try to improve on the formulation by using probability theory and that in its turn led to the whole development of what is now called topic models um, where you have models like latent Dirichlet allocation which is pretty much uh, the same thing as a probabilistic very, uh, formulation of LSA. The main difference between uh, LDA and topic models and LSA is that when you do the SVD, um, you're really assuming Gaussian distribution uh, of the values in the co-occurrence matrix. And we know that that's not true for language data. So uh, from that perspective, SVD would be a bad fit for lateral language data. And that's why um, people nowadays typically feel that using multinomial distributions like Dirichlet uh, provides a better statistical uh, prior to, to language data. But the general idea is exactly the same. We have a words by documents matrix and we want to infer term relationships based on the underlying uh, second order distributions there. Um, I thought maybe we could have questions if there are any on the words by regions type matrices uh, before we go into the other type of, of models. So Piero, is there any questions? Are there any questions on this uh, uh, Latin semantic analysis stuff? Okay. No, it's all clear. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's so nice that everything is clear. Um, so uh, this was one of the major types of models. And the other main type of model uh, 
something called words by words matrices. So in the first type of model, we have text regions as columns of the data. Here, we have words as columns of the data. Okay. So this is a word by word matrix, and uh, we, uh, we populate it by noting when words occur together. So the word coffee has occurred one time together with drink and one time together with the last word there. And this will lead to a representation that is purely paradigmatic. That is, words that co-occur with the same other words will get similar distributional vectors. So if we have a word by cof uh, as coffee and a word like tea, and they both co-occur with the word drink, they will well, get quite similar distributional vectors. So this is a very nice way of getting at the paradigmatic similarities. Um, however, there is one other very nice feature of these matrices, which is often neglected in, in distributional semantics, and it's the fact that we also get the syntagmatic similarity, and we get that by looking at the individual vector dimensions. So, coffee uh, has a syntagmatic relationship with drink. So imagine that we would populate this matrix based on very large data set, and then we would look at the vector for the word coffee. Now, the dimension that has the highest value would be the word that has co-occurred together with coffee the most number of times. So that would be the strongest syntagmatic relationship. So this is a matrix where we get at both the paradigmatic similarities by computing row vectors, similarities between row vectors, and the syntagmatic similarity by simply looking at vector dimensions. Okay. So, uh, from a linguistic perspective, uh, this is a much nicer matrix to work with than the words by regions type style. Um, another thing to note is that when we have this matrix, there is really no need to do uh, a factorization in order to induce higher order relationships because it's already present in the matrix. Okay, so there is no need for the latent variable uh, here. And of course, these type of models differ uh, with respect to a large number of features, and I think it's useful to list them just to, to get an overview over what, is, um, what, what the main mode of variation is. Uh, the context window is something that I haven't talked about yet, but it's the window within which we count co-occurrences. So imagine that I have a sequence like I drink coffee at the cafe, then maybe I just want to note co-occurrences that are very local. So if drink occurs next to coffee, then I put the one in my matrix. But I neglect the words that are further out within the window. Or perhaps we want to include very long-range relationships. So I drink some kind of black, hot and very tasty beverage at the cafe, and they tell me it's called coffee. Uh, so maybe drink and coffee there should be related. But we have a large number of words in between, so how should the context window look like here? And there, uh, there are a large number of, of possible solutions to this. Uh, we'll talk about some of them in just a minute. Of course, we also have the, uh, the factor of weighting the frequencies. So I should say that there is, uh, to my knowledge, not a single model that uses raw frequencies in the co-occurrence matrix. Everyone is doing something with the frequencies, normalizing them in some manner or weighting them in some manner. And uh, I think the state of the art today would be to weight the matrix elements by pointwise mutual information, um, or at least some formulation of mutual information-based measure. And then, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, possible to do some kind of dimensional reduction, and we will talk about that uh, later on, several different methods of doing that. And, of course, various uh, type of similarity metrics, and we'll also come back to that in just a minute. Uh, I just want to cover the, the most uh, well-known type of words-by-word -word style model, which is called the hyperspace analog to language. It's a very nice... Uh, term, I think, HAL. Uh, and this was not developed in, in the information retrieval community, like I say. This was developed by well, a bunch of psychologists, actually, from the start. Uh, so this is more from the cognitive perspective, then. 
Hal uses a sliding context window uh, that spans 10 words. That is, it's sliding, that means that we, we have our 10 word, 10 token word window, and then we update the co-occurrence information, and then we slide it one step at a time over the entire data set. And then another feature here is that we count co-occurrences in only one direction. So we only count co-occurrences to the right within the window. And then uh, we also weight the frequency counts by the distance of the words within the context window. Well, I will give you some, uh, at least one example here. Um, so imagine we have the, uh, the sentence, I drink coffee and tea at the cafe, and then we build our words by word co-occurrence matrix. We neglect the stop words. So we have I drink coffee, tea, and cafe as uh, rows and the same words as columns. And then when we see the word I, we put a 10, which is the highest weight, for the word drink. We put a 9 for the word coffee. We put an 8 for the word tea and 7 for the word cafe. And then we slide the window one step. So now we look at the word drink. And then we put a 10 for, at the dimension for the word coffee. 9 at the dimension for the word T, and 8 at the word uh, coffee. And then we slide the window and continue to update the matrix. And that will generate what we call a directional words-by-words co-occurrence matrix. So the rows and the columns for a word will contain co-occurrence information about preceding and succeeding words. So if you look at the row for the word coffee, that contains information about which words occurs to the right of the word coffee, namely tea and cafe. But if you look at the column for the word coffee, that contains information about which words occur to the left, namely I drink. So this is a, it's a nice me uh, method from a linguistic perspective because not only do you get that paradigmatic similarity, you also include at least some rudimentary uh, form of word order information here. But of course, um, if you have this matrix, what you want to do is you want to compare distributional vectors. But now you actually have two vectors for each word. So what do you do? Well, you simply concatenate them. So you don't add them together, but you concatenate them. Uh, you put the row uh, uh, or you put the column after the row vector. So that will generate a 2m dimensional vector. It will be twice as large as the number of columns in the matrix. And this, of course, uh, with a very large data set, will generate very high dimensional vectors. Um, if that's a problem, uh, in the original HAL model, they discarded uh, dimensions which has a very low variance. That simply means that if you have a context word or a column there that has very similar co-occurrence information across the entire vocabulary, it's not really providing any information. So you can simply discard it and remove it. It's a very simple form of dimension reduction, but it's uh, surprisingly effective. And that leads us to a model that uh, represents uh, uh, paradigmatic similarity. Uh, and another nice feature is that it contains also directional word order information. Um, right, so there has been a lot of uh, formulations of this type of models uh, and uh, a large number of variations uh, on them. And uh, I will not cover any of the variations, but I will also I will mention uh, something that has been uh, quite popular in the natural language processing community in the last couple of years, which is uh, dependency-based models. Um, so here the idea is that, well, instead of just using these uh, quite naive context windows that just look at local information, we can utilize our uh, linguistic knowledge about the structure of the data. So we can build a dependency uh, tree and then we can model uh, the context according to the paths of this tree. So what you see here is a dependency tree uh, for this uh, small toy example. And the, the tree structure is simply the dependency structure. Uh, 
So you see that sweet has, a, well, occurs, well, has a direct dependency to apples, but it's quite far away, the word carry, uh, well, not very far, but two steps away from the word carry in the dependency graph, whereas it's close to, to uh, in the surface structure. So the idea here would be that, well, if we have long-range dependencies in language, then using this type of pre-processing would actually make the models a bit better in capturing that. Um, now, I should also say that uh, if you start to actually uh, uh, compute statistics on how often the dependency path differs from the local context, you will see that it's not very often. Uh, and that might also explain results which sort of indicate that uh, these type of models might not benefit all that much from doing this. But the idea here is that we can use the dependency paths as the context window and we only then count contexts that are linked by a syntactic re relation. And usually um, we only count a direct link. So we only traverse one step in the dependency have. Uh, so imagine you have a sentence like a big dog bites a tall man, uh, then you would update the vector for dog uh, for the word bite, which is uh, in a direct dependency relation, and for the word big, but you would not update the word tall. Um, and for man you would put a one in bite and tall, but not in big. Um, this is really a bad example because you would get the exact same effect if you use a context window. Uh, so you really need to have long-range dependencies in order to see the effect here. Uh, another way of use, utilizing dependency uh, parse data is to use actually the, the tuples as dimensions. So not only just a direct uh, relationship, but the type of relationship. So uh, we'll, we'll actually add information not only about how close things are in the dependency graph, but also which type of syntactic dependencies things have. So imagine that I have this small data set here, a dog bites a man, a man bites a dog, and a dog bites a man. Then um, we would um, have two dimensions in this toy example, namely where the word occurs as subject to bite or when the word occurs as object to bite. And then for the word dog, we would put two co-occurrence uh, counts in the first dimension and one co-occurrence count in the second dimension. And for the word man, we would do the opposite thing. It occurs one time as subject to bite and two times as object to bite. And this will generate then, it's, it will still be a words by words model and it will still contain paradigmatic similarity. But the idea would be that it contains a bit more refined co-occurrence statistics because we use the uh, dependency structure of the data. Um, uh, and I don't think I will say anything more about that. I will um, just uh, finish up this uh, short introduction about the general types of distribution of semantic models here um, uh, by saying that uh, the models uh, differ uh, then with regards to the context configuration if we use text regions, what type of text regions, documents, uh, paragraphs, sentences or whatever. Um, or if we use words, or if we use dependency parsed data, there are several different uh, possibilities here. Also, of course, the frequency weighting, uh, as you saw, LSA used an entropy-based measure. In word-based models, it's very common to use some type of mutual information-based method. Um, and also the dimension reduction step. We have only talked about uh, truncated singular value decomposition or um, column variance reduction, but we will cover some other types in, in the last part of the lecture. And also the similarity metric we will talk about a bit more later on. But the key here uh, when talking about these type of models is understanding how the choice of context really determines the type of semantic relations that the model can capture. And it's, uh, it's, it's actually quite simple. If we use text regions as uh, dimensions of the model, we will capture topical similarity. And if we do, the uh, 
factorization step, we will approximate paradigmatic relations. Whereas if we use this type of words by words matrix, we will actually can cap capture paradigmatic similarities directly. And of course, there might be different types of application scenarios for using these ty uh, type of models. And uh, if I have time, I might be uh, able to talk about these type of applications. Um, right, is there any questions so far? Uh, you can just see if there are any questions. So any questions right now? I have one, so I can ask you. Yeah. Um, um, basically, um, uh, first you, you showed the models where you use um, a window of words for um, populating the concurrence matrix. Then you show us um, some models would depend on syntactic relations and also maybe uh, semantic relations like, uh, in, uh, like in semantic role labeling. Uh, but how do the, the distance um, uh, affect the performances of these models and also the way they represent the thing? Uh, okay, so uh, I, maybe now I don't really understand what you're getting at, but you say how does the distance affect the models? I'm, I'm guessing you mean the distance uh, of the context window, right? Okay, very good. So, uh, yes, um, that really depends on what type of evaluation task you have. But if you're interested in capturing paradigmatic similarities, which is what we have been talking about so far, and which is what I think these models are, are designed to do, then really using a very narrow, very local context window is the optimal choice. Um, not going farther than two words or three words to the left and right that's an optimal parameter for capturing paradigmatic relationships. And that's basically applicable to uh, any type of language that we have encountered. Um, we don't really see the effect of long-range dependencies affecting these type of models. Are there okay. any other questions? Okay, no more questions for now. You can oh, go on. Oh, oh, yep. We'll continue uh, going through here. Uh, so now we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the similarities and some steps of actually uh, computing these type of, of vectors. And the distributional vectors are really the heart of these models. Um, and as we have seen, what we do is we count how many times each target word occurs in a certain context. We collect all that information in a vector that contains frequency counts. So what we get is something like this. It's a high dimensional vector containing large number of values. And um, I know that Tom, Tom Landauer, who is one of the inventors of LSA, he, when he has talks, he usually shows uh, a large number of, of um, he shows a big vector and he says that no, this is the meaning of life. <laughs> in a sense it is. So this is the meaning of a word here. But of course, this is a distributed representation. We can't really say anything ju just by looking at the vector. So what's the point? Well, the point is we use this vector to compute similarities between vectors. And now uh, I will talk a little bit about vector similarity. Uh, this might be very trivial to, uh, to some of you. Uh, but let's go through it uh, anyway, because there are some interesting things to note here. So imagine that we have three vectors. We have a vector for tea, we have a vector for coffee, and we have a vector for drugs. And we have only two dimensions here. We have drink and abuse. And what these vectors tell tells us is that uh, drugs has been used uh, more with the word abused than with drink. And the word T has been used more with drink than abuse. Um, so this is, a, this is a very small semantic space. Now, and you can see that coffee there is closer to T than it is to drugs here, because it has been used more with the word drink than it has with the word abuse, right? Now, imagine that we would have not seen as much data yet. So we have only seen a few examples of the word 
drugs and coffee. And for drugs, we have seen with just a tiny amount of examples that contain the word drink, but most of them contain the word abuse. And for coffee, most of them contain the word drink, but we have seen some examples of where people have talked about abusing coffee. Okay, now if we would compute the distance to drugs from coffee and the distance from coffee to tea, then we would actually find that coffee is closer to drugs here in this type of example. And this may or may not be what we want. This is something called the frequency effect. Uh, and that simply means that we have a similarity that depends very much on the frequency of the words. Um, and as I said, this may or may not be what you want. Uh, typically, uh, it is assumed that we don't want to have frequency effects uh, because uh, there is something called the sparse data problem, which means that no matter how much data we see, we only see a sample of the actual language use. So our statistics will sort of lie to us anyway. And uh, what, what we typically do in this scenario is that we look at the angles of the vectors instead. So coffee there is going in the same direction as the word T. Even though we haven't seen that much data, we know that it's traveling in that direction. And there, even if we just see a few examples, we see that coffee will be closer to tea than it is to drugs here. So just to give you an intuitive uh, way of uh, understanding what vector similarity is about. There are, of course, a uh, huge number of algorithms that you can use to compute vector similarity. I'll just talk about the main uh, types of similarity measures and some of their uh, uh, properties. So one uh, family of uh, similarity metrics is called the Minkowski distance family, where you simply take uh, the sum of differences between vector elements. And there are a number of variations of this. You have uh, the city block or Manhattan distance, where you have n equal to 1, or Euclidean distance, where you have n equal to 2. Now. Uh, one potential issue with this, using this type of Minkowski distances is that high-frequent words, words that we have seen a large number of samples of, will uh, become very distant from all other words simply because of their frequency. And as I said, this may or may not be what you want, but here you will actually have a very uh, pronounced frequency effect. Um, another way of computing similarity is to take the scalar product, which is simply you multiply vector dimensions with each other. And here you would actually see the opposite effect. So if you have high frequent words, they will end up being very close to all the other words. So also a frequency effect, but inverted from the other one. So uh, the most common uh, type of similarity metric in distributional semantics is to use cosine similarity, which is simply looking at the angles between vectors because what you're doing is you're normalizing for vector length. So the idea is that you don't get these frequency effects by using cosine similarity. Um, but as I said, uh, it should be noted that frequency effects may be what you want in certain applications. So it's something to think about. And what we typically do, the, the, the typical operation once we have computed our semantic vector space, or the distribution of semantic uh, vectors, what we do is something called nearest neighbor search, which is extracting the k nearest neighbors to a target word. So imagine we, we are interested in, in a word, let's say we're interested in the word red, and we're interested in which words are most paradigmatically related to this word, then what we do is a nearest neighbor search. And that works in the following way. We have to compute the cosine similarity between the context vector, and that should really say distributional vector, of the target word and the vectors of all other words in the word space. So this is really an exhaustive search. So we do pairwise similarity computations between the target word and all the other words uh, in the data. Then we sort the resulting similarities and we return only the top k uh, works. So that's a, a nearest neighbor search. And of course it should be noted now that if you have a very large data set with a very large vocabulary, uh, that will lead to very high dimensional vectors. So you would both have 
large vocabulary in high dimensional vectors, and then doing these pairwise similarity computations will take some time. Um, it will take a lot of time for very large data sets. Um, and unfortunately, nearest neighbor search uh, is sort of an, uh, it, it's not really possible to optimize this operation. You, you are forced to do brute force uh, exhaustive searches. Um, right, and this is a typical example of, of doing a nearest neighbor search. So what you see here is um, you have two target words, hot and cold, and then uh, uh, you have extracted five nearest neighbors to hot and cold in three different data sets. So in the first column you see a general data set, which is the British National Corpus. Uh, the second column is from a news data set uh, provided by Reuters. And the third column is from a uh, blog data set provided by Spinner. And you see that uh, the nearest neighbors are different in semantic frame and they are different in quality. Uh, and the, you see some interesting examples here. So let's go through them. So for the word hot, uh, the nearest neighbors from the BNC data is really about uh, liquids. It's about hot water and hot liquids, boiling, distilled, brackish, drinking water. Everything there is water. The syntagmatic relation is water. And you have hot and cold being uh, antonyms. They also, uh, <coughs> of course, occur in the same context there. <coughs> Interestingly enough, in the news data set, uh, all the words there are only about weather, of course, because temperature words in, in news uh, are pretty much only about weather. And in the blog data set, you have some words that are about temperature, some words are about uh, hot liquids, and then you have some weird neighbors. And this is very typical of these type of models, because you will get the relationships that are present in the data. It might not be what you're expecting, but it's really present in the data, right? And that also brings us to problems with evaluating these type of models, because this is data mining. Uh, what we uncover is the truth about the data, whether you like it or not. Um, and uh, I don't know if we will have time to talk about evaluation. Uh, that could be a discussion of its own. If we look at the word cold in the, in the British National Corpus, you see very a very clear um, uh, example of polysemy, where you have some temperature words, like hot and cold, but then the other words are really about the Cold War, the Franco-Prussian War, Boer War. The, it's a syntagmatic connection with war here. Um, and this is, of course, also... Um, uh, another effect of using these type of, of models, you will end up with polysemy effects in the vector spaces. Uh, for the news data set, you will have w other weather-related terms, and in the blog data set, you have a very clear collocation that generates the uh, nearest neighbors, namely ice cold, ice cream, ice cube, etc. Okay. So just to give you a, a flavor of, of what the uh, results of these type of models look like, in reality. Right, so um, before we take a small break, I want to go through just the basic step-by-step -step, uh, in building a distributional semantic model uh, so that you can go and program one yourself after this lecture. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, like the linguistic steps uh, that is dealing with the data. So imagine that we have this data here. I drank very strong Arabica coffees at the cafe. So the first thing that we probably want to do here is we want to pre-process uh, pre the corpus. You don't have to do that, but uh, people typically do that in, in experiments, in lab experiments. And that uh, might include things like tokenization, so uh, removing all punctuation or non-letter uh, characters from the data set, cleaning it up. We might also want to downcase things, like Arabica there becomes downcased and I becomes downcased. We might also want to do stemming or lemmatization, that is removing uh, uh, different morphological variations. And um, if you're not familiar with the difference between stemming and lemmatization, stemming is a, a heuristic way of doing it by simply cutting off uh, the endings of words, so that will overgenerate. Uh, and lemmatization is a bit more re refined using uh, a lexicon and some rules. 
leading to more high quality results typically. Um, you might also want to do some sort of linguistic markup. That's of course optional. Um, people sometimes do it, people sometimes don't do it. Uh, it's uh, of course uh, there is a cost in doing it which might be uh, an issue. So you might want to do part of speech tagging. Um, there is uh, assigning the part of speech for each word. You might want to do uh, syntactic parsing, uh, maybe as we talked about doing dependency parsing uh, or chunking. Uh, you might also want to do named entity recognition or semantic role labeling uh, or even more refined linguistic markup. And then of course you need to select uh, the target words Maybe you're interested in all the words in the data, or you're just interested in the names in the data, or just a, a small vocabulary that you have predefined. And you need to define the linguistic context, which are either text regions or words, basically, right? And then we have the statistical steps, which is uh, counting the target context co-occurrences, building up our co-occurrence uh, matrix. Then we might want to wait uh, the contexts or weight the frequency counts. Uh, you don't have to do that, but uh, uh, it, it is usually done and it improves the results. And we have seen some examples like entropy-based or, uh, or distance weighting. And as I said before, different types of association measures are, are uh, usually used like mutual information in different uh, formulations. Uh, you might also want to do a reduction of the date matrix dimensions, and this is primarily because it might be computationally heavy uh, to deal with very large uh, matrices. Uh, and the typical solution of doing that is to use the dimension reduction method, and we'll talk more about that after the break. Uh, what that means and how you can do that. And of, of course, you need also to define the dimensionality that, that you're aiming at in the reduced space. And then, of course, the last step is to compute vector similarities and do nearest neighbor searches. Um, and then you need to decide on what type of similarity metric you want to use, uh, like the cosine or, or something else. And then, uh, before we take a break now, I just want to... Uh, mention a few of the tools that are available and these are open source projects um, and I think all of these are very nice. Uh, I usually recommend the first one, S-Space, uh, to students because it contains the most number of algorithms and it has a very active developer community. It's written in Java, it's very simple to use and you can contribute to the code base if you want to. The second one, Semantic Vectors, is also a Java package. It's, uh, it's based on Lucene, uh, which is the, the vector space uh, information retrieval library. So it might be a little bit trickier to compile, but then again, it, it contains some nice features based on Lucene. And then the last package is a Python package, which is more based on topic modeling. So that includes LSA, PLSA and LDA style methods. Um, so not, not, uh, there is not a single package that contains all of the methods, unfortunately. But, but if, you, if, you, if you download S-Space and, and GenSim, uh, or Semantic Vectors and GenSim, then you have pretty much all the, the available algorithms. Um, and so, Pierre, I, uh, I think that now would be a good time to have a short break. Uh, Let's say, I don't know what you want. Do you want 10 or 15 minutes? Uh, whatever you prefer, Magnus. Uh, so for me, uh, 10 minutes is okay. Okay, so let's stop for 10 minutes and see you again here in 10 minutes. Okay, very good. Okay, very good. Thank you. I'm closing the connection, okay? So yeah, yeah. you call us again when you're ready. Okay, very good. Perfect. Bye. <laughs> some of the underlying theories and covered the basic models and the basic sort of computational steps of generating these models. We can talk about how we actually deal with these type of representations when we are uh, confronted with very, very large data streams. That's called big data. So I'm sure you've seen this term. It's sort of a silly term in a way. 
Um, the original meaning of big data is to get more data that you can handle. Uh, and that's, uh, even if you think it would be easy to get that, it turns out it's not so easy to get your hands on more data that you can handle. Um, so let's just call it very large data. But the, 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 the most important point here is that there are really different requirements of models that we use in a lab environment than if we are confronted with the real world. Um, so in a lab environment, you can use a lot of nice tools and uh, it's not really a problem if the tools are a little bit brittle and might break because you can replace them. But in the real world, you really need to be prepared for uh, dirty data and you have a lot of them, and your tools need to be robust, and they need to actually work, right? A little bit different requirements here, and we'll see how that affects uh, the type of experiments that people do. So in the lab environment, we typically select uh, a data set a corpus to work with, and there are a large number of those available that people typically use, so the first batch of publications of distributional semantics used uh, a, a text data called the TASA corpus, uh, which is roughly 10 million uh, running words. It's a very balanced corpus, which means it contains different genres. Um, there are other types of balanced corpora, like the American National Corpus, the ANC, which is of similar size, it's like 10 million words, or the British National Corpus, which is a little bit bigger, it's 100 million words, um, and you also have uh, a little bit bigger data sets like the WAC data, which is the web as a corpus, which I think contains like one billion or two billion words, something like that. You can also download the entire Wikipedia, which will generate a couple of billion words. Uh, but even so, these data sets are small to medium sized. And of course, the data sets are static. So you can rerun your experiments on the same data set, the data doesn't change, it's there and you can do stuff with it, you can massage it and you can do pre-processing. And also, for the most part, uh, it contains editorial text. So that simply means that someone has been editing the text. It's a very clean language in these data sets. It's grammatically correct for the most part, and it contains a very large, a small amount of spelling errors and, and surface variations. And of course, in a lab environment, uh, processing cost is not really critical. So it doesn't matter if you do a very heavy matrix factorization that takes weeks. You can afford to wait for that, unless you have a deadline, of course. But processing cost is not really a critical thing here. And also, of course, processing dependencies are acceptable and actually sometimes even preferred. Uh, and what I mean by processing dependencies is that maybe we are requiring our model to use, for example, dependency parse data or part of speech tagged data. And there is another thing here, uh, speaking of processing dependencies, this type of of pre-processing is, uh, of course, acceptable for this type of data sets because they are editorial and they contain very clean language because these um, linguistic resources are typically trained on this type of data. So the performance of a part of speech tagger or a dependency parser, you can expect it to be in the upper 90% of, of uh, correctness. And that's very good. But if you have um, very noisy data, then the parser or the part of speech tagger will break down because it hasn't been trained on that type of data. Okay. Um, and this is the type of, you've already seen examples of nearest neighborhoods, but this is uh, just the nearest neighborhood of the word recommend from the British National Corpus, just using a standard distributional semantic model. You see words that belong to sort of the same paradigm, they have something to do with recommend, uh, maybe not direct synonyms, but they are sort of in the same semantic field. Uh, now, of course, in the real world, when we talk about using these type of models with very large number, uh, very large data and with very unclean data, 
it really is a matter of dumbing things down and scaling things up. We can't really afford to do all the fancy stuff that we do in lab experiments. The type of data that we are often confronted with is uh, very large data sets uh, and sometimes all even big data, more data that we can actually afford to process. This type of data is also uh, very dynamic, uh, often of a streaming nature. There is data is coming into the, to the model all the time. It never stops and the distributions in the data change this constantly. Um, so right now in our production system here at Gavagai, I think we are uh, processing more than uh, I think 15 million documents per day, uh, which is a couple of billion words per day. And uh, that's very noisy data. And that's of course another point here, that it's, this is non-editorial, it's data generated by anyone. Um, and as I said before, this type of language use is quite different from uh, the data sets that we have in our static corpora. This is very productive and very noisy. And some examples of typical neighborhoods using um, social media data, if we put in a word like recommend, the nearest neighbors are actually surface variants here, from spelling errors, uh, and then we have words that are, well, synonyms in this case. So people have been saying, I recommend this product and I love this product and I love this product. And there are some other examples further down the list also. And uh, this is a nice example of uh, how these models are useful in a scenario where vocabulary variation is very predominant. Because as a human expert, you may not have a guess that you would find love with a large number of O's here as a pseudonym for recommend. But this is something you find when you do the data mining process. Another example, just because it's so nice, <laughs> is uh, the nearest neighbors from, for good and bad, and this is from social media data. You find a large number of potential synonyms or uh, related expressions. And you would not find one lexicon that contains all of these potential synonyms. People are very productive. And in the word, in the list for bad there, you also see the polysemy effect where you have cool as a nearest neighbor. So uh, polysemy uh, is, is something we have to get used to dealing with these type of models. Um, and this is the, the, the real-world scenario here. This graph shows the amount of new words that we encounter every day in different type of data sets. So the blue line down there with the x-axis, that's the amount of new words that we encounter in news text every day. So that shows that even in news text, we do encounter new words every day. So you open the newspaper and then you start reading about the cyclotron or an artwork or something like that. And you have no idea what that means, but you sort of, you, you have to acquire the knowledge of that. But of course, the situation is even worse when you look at social media data. So the red line up there, the very steep one, that's the amount of new words in tweets. And that's several hundreds of thousands of new words every day. So we need to deal with that. Now imagine that you would build a co-occurrence matrix every day based on this. That would be a very, very, very large matrix. Okay? And this is the real world scenario here. We need to handle this if we want to build our distributional semantic models here. And that also means that processing costs in this type of scenario really is critical. We can't afford to sit around and wait for a matrix factorization to take weeks before it gives us a result. We need to be able to have models that are more or less real time, that can take in data, generate the semantic representation and be ready for it to be used instantaneously. And also processing dependencies in this type of scenario really is a liability. Because if you have data sets that have a very large um, va vocabulary variation and that is very noisy, you can't afford to rely on resources that may have a very low performance grade. 
So using a typical parser or typical part of speech tagger in this type of social media data will give you very, very low results. And that would generate noise into the model, and that's a liability. So processing cost is very critical here, and processing dependencies is something that we would like to get rid of as far as we can. And the real problem here is that we have a large data set coming in, and the big problem is that we need to build this huge co-occurrence matrix, because otherwise we don't have any vectors to work with. Okay, so what is the, pro pro what is the solution to this problem here? Well, the typical solution, of course, would be to use dimension reduction. Okay, so instead of having a huge co-occurrence matrix to work with, you can have a bit smaller co-occurrence matrix to work with. And, of course, that might solve the problem, right? Okay, so let's look at dimension reduction. Um, and uh, explaining this in detail will be very uh, technical, so I will not do that. I will just mention the main modes of, of approach that you can do uh, dimension reduction and some of the uh, mostly used uh, techniques so matrix factorization is something that we have already talked about, actually. We have talked about the singular value decomposition, which factorizes the matrix into three different submatrices, and then you truncate the dimensions of the factorized matrices, and you, you arrive at a dimension-reduced space. So I should explain something here also, because this might be confusing. What you're doing when you're doing the SVD and the truncated SVD is not really approximating back the original matrix. You do the factorization, and your U matrix will contain the original rows. And that's what we're interested in, because we're interested in the row similarities. So you truncate that matrix, and also the sigma matrix, because that contains the singular values. And then you compute term similarity in the U sigma space. And that's typically on the order of 300 dimensions to a couple of hundred dimensions when you use SVD has been shown to be optimal. So you arrive at a, a reduced space. A very similar method is principal component analysis. It's actually usually computed by doing an, a singular value decomposition and arriving at the principal component analysis from the SVD. So it's more or less equivalent. Um, and there is also another technique called non-negative matrix factorization, which factorizes matrix into two different sub-matrices, uh, uh, something called the W matrix and the H matrix. And the W is the one containing the original rows. Uh, and this last non-negative matrix factorization technique also has a direct uh, correspondence to LDA, which we mentioned before. So, we won't go into the details of the maths here, but, but these are uh, different techniques of arriving at factorization and reducing uh, the dimensionality uh, by this factorization. Another uh, family of dimension reduction methods, which is a bit more efficient, um, is something called random projection, which is simply you're projecting your co-occurrence matrix through a random matrix of a bit lower dimensionality, and you arrive at a uh, dimension uh, reduced uh, approximation. So this is a very dumb way of doing dimension reduction, but it works surprisingly well, and we'll come back to why soon. Uh, there is also, of course, the uh, option of just using simple statistics, like column variance that we saw uh, in the case of HAL. So we can just discard uh, dimensions that ha have a low variance in the matrix without actually computing any latent factors. Okay, and this is all fine, uh, but you notice here that all of these methods actually require us to build the co-occurrence matrix before we can actually do something. So, uh, we haven't really solved the problem here, have we? We still need to build the huge co-occurrence matrix. Okay, so we have attacked the problem of using the co-occurrence matrix and doing nearest neighbor search. What we haven't really solved the problem of having to build it in the first place. And if you have streaming data, this is really the big problem. You can't afford to build the co-occurrence matrix in this way. So what, what is the solution here? Well, the solution is to not build the co-occurrence matrix at all. Because, well, that's the problem. 
And there are a number of ways of avoiding the, to have to build the huge co-occurrence matrix. And the most simple approach here is to simply restrict the number of contexts that we want to use. Uh, so this nice little figure here uh, is a figure uh, defined by Hans-Peter Loon. It's, it's a guy who invented modern search systems. He used to work at IBM in the 50s. And um, this graph here shows the frequency distribution of words in language. I'm pretty sure you're all aware of uh, the SIPF uh, distribution, as it's called, the power law distribution. So uh, and what that tells us is there are a small number of words that have very high frequency, and the frequency distribution is very long-tailed, so that you have a large number of words that have a very low frequency. And then the idea... Uh, that Hans-Peter Loon uh, formulated was that we're really interested in the mid-frequency range here and we would like a function that defines the amount of information of these mid-frequency words. That would be the bell curve there. And Hans-Peter Loon, he defined uh, TFIDF as the, uh, as the method of computing this bell curve. Um, and this is sort of what we would like then if we want to uh, use a set of predefined contexts. We want to find contexts that we think are informative. So maybe we choose a set of words based on some idea that they represent uh, the variation of meaning in language. Perhaps we can use like a Swadesh list or uh, just compute uh, some statistics on a data set and use the mid-frequency range of the vocabulary or something else. And this is, of course, a very nice approach. But if your frequency distribution changes a lot, and that's typically the case when you have streaming data, then this might be a liability. You can't be sure that one of your predefined contexts will actually be relevant. Um, so another solution of, of not building the huge co-occurrence matrix is to use something called random indexing. And uh, this is what we'll spend the rest of, of today, or at least my lecture, uh, talking about now. So random indexing is a method that is designed to be online, which means it's more or less a real-time processing scenario. We don't stop to do any factorization or or, or statistics, we process all the time. It's designed to be very scalable, which means that we should be able to handle very large data sets. And it's designed to be efficient, so not requiring a lot of uh, CPU time. It's based on uh, uh, a researcher called Panti Kanarva, his work on sparse distributed memory, which is a model of human uh, memory processing or intelligence uh, uh, processing of information um, and it can be used with any type of context um, so even if we want to build an LSA style model uh, or a HAL type model or a dependency style model uh, or whatever uh, a model that contains image information we can use random indexing as the computational framework and I'll go through very uh, in, much in detail of how this works um, so in a standard co-occurrence matrix, um, we use one unique dimension per context, right? So context number one in this data set has, uh, is represented by dimension or column number one in the co-occurrence matrix. So it's a, a bit of a, of a luxury that these contexts have one unique dimension each. Um, uh, so, in a way, we can say that this is sort of a symbolic representation because the dimensions really mean something here. It means a uh, unique context, right? Now, in random indexing, what we say is that, okay, uh, the context can have several dimensions and they can't be unique anymore. So, the context can share dimensions with each other. So imagine that we have five dimensions, and then we have a context number one. It can be represented by two dimensions here. Uh, context number uh, one has dimensions one and three. 
And then we have another context which can be represented by dimensions 1 and 4, for example. And then if we have another context, it can be represented by dimensions 2 and 4. Okay, so the idea here is that contexts can be represented by several dimensions, and they uh, don't have to be unique for that particular context. So what this means is that the dimensionality here is no longer defined by the number of contexts. On the, uh, instead, it is a parameter. So at the beginning of processing, we say that we want to use this many uh, dimensions. Uh, and normally, we use uh, a couple of thousand dimensions. And we'll come back to why we, we, why we do that. So a, a very important point here is that in random indexing, the dimensionality will never increase. So we set the dimensionality uh, from the start, and then we begin to process. And it really doesn't matter how much data we see. The dimensionality will never increase. It will remain constant. And that's what makes it so scalable, of course. Um, now, as I said, uh, contexts are represented by uh, several non-unique dimensions, and which dimensions uh, a context is represented by is selected purely at random. And that's why we call it random indexing. And now, you might think there is something fishy going on here because we're just selecting things at random. So, wouldn't there be a risk that several contexts get exactly the same representation? Well, yes, you might think that, but it turns out that the risk is very, very, very small. We can discard of that risk altogether. Um, and we'll come back to, to the reason why uh, that really doesn't happen. Um, so by choosing random dimensions for the context, we arrive at very nice representations. The selected dimensions um, can be seen sort of as a fingerprint, uh, or what we call an index for that context. So now it's a pattern of dimensions that represent the context. Okay? So let's call it the, the, the index of that context. And now, since only the selected dimensions are active for a particular context, we can describe the index as a vector where only the active dimensions are non-zero. So in our example that we had before, context number one was represented by the first and third dimensions. That's, uh, that leads us to this type of representation where we have a one in the first dimension, a one in the third dimension, and the rest of the dimensions are zero, because they are not active for that context. And the same goes for the other context here. Now, and since the, the dimensions have been selected randomly, we call this a random index vector. Okay? And this is the basic uh, entity that we deal with in random indexing. These are random index vectors. Um, now, these random index vectors are generated to have the following distribution. Uh, now, you should notice a couple of things here, that we're not only using 1 and 0. We're actually using plus 1, 0, and minus 1 as values here. And they are generated with a sort of probability distribution, uh, which uh, in this case says that we will have a very small number of plus 1s and minus 1s, and we will have a large number of uh, zeros, which means that the generated vectors will be ternary, they will contain plus ones, minus ones, and zeros, and they will be very sparse, that is, they contain mostly zeros, and they will contain an equal number of plus ones and minus ones. So you have two parameters in random indexing. One is the dimensionality of the vectors that we want to use, and the other one is the sparsity of these vectors or the number of active dimensions. Typical choices uh, in the first publications of random indexing, uh, Penty and, and the rest of the colleagues at SIX used uh, 2,000 dimensions and typically around eight non-zero elements. So that means four plus ones and four minus ones. And this is just a historic choice. Um, um, this uh, framework is very robust to the choice of parameters, so you can choose uh, k to be on the order of thousands, and delta would be perhaps like 10 non-zero elements, uh, and that will be sufficient for most data sets. Um, 
The important point here is that these vectors are high dimensional, on the order of thousands. They are very sparse. They contain like 10 uh, non-zero elements. They are ternary, which means they contain plus ones and minus ones, and they are completely random. Okay, so now you might wonder why do we use the minus ones here? And the answer is uh, simply that we want to be able to use the sort of entire space because if you only use positive numbers, only plus ones and minus ones, you would actually only utilize the upper quadrant here. So we use plus ones and minus ones in order to use the entire uh, space of representation. Now, these random index vectors are then used to build the distributional vectors. And they are in, uh, accumulated in a purely incremental fashion. As we see data coming in, we build these distributional vectors. And the idea is that each word gets assigned a distributional vector. Uh, when we see a new word, it gets a new distributional vector. And at the beginning of processing, it's completely empty. We know the dimensionality, but it's completely zero, initialized, because we haven't seen any data yet. Each context is assigned a random index vector. So when we have a new context, we simply just select a few random dimensions, assign plus ones and minus ones to them. And then every time a word occurs, we add the context's random index vector to the word's distributional vector. And we continue to do that every time we observe a co-occurrence event. This uh, might be a little bit confusing now, so I'll, I'll go through a graphic example of how it works, so that you can actually see how, it's, how, how the idea is. Okay, so imagine that we want to build our co-occurrence matrix here. Uh, so as before, we have the vocabulary as rows of this matrix, word number one, word number two, etc. And here we don't really have any meaning of the dimensions. We have five dimensions. It's uh, set to be five dimensions. And at the beginning of processing there, we observe a co-occurrence event. We, W1 there means word number one, and C1 means context number one. So this word occurs in a certain context here. And the context is represented by one of these random index vectors. It's five dimensions and it contains one plus one and one minus one. So what we do now is we update the distributional vector for word number one based on this random index vector. We simply add the random index vector to the distributional vector for word number one. Now we observe the next co-occurrence event Word number one occurs in context number two, and context number two has a certain random representation, and then we add that random representation to the row for word number one, and it will look like that, because plus one and minus one cancel each other out in the first dimension there. And then we continue processing, we observe a new co-occurrence event, context number three has a random representation, we add that to the distributional vector for the word, and then we continue to do that. So in this way we assign random index vectors to context, we uh, incrementally add them together to form these distributional vectors. And we can do that uh, to generate, as I said, basically any type of co-occurrence based model. And I'll take two examples. The first is the words by regions style matrices, where we want to um, look at how words occur in, in documents. So every time a word occurs, we will add the text regions index vector to the words distributional vector. And we can also uh, build words by words style matrices, in which case we, every time a word occurs, we add the index vectors of the surrounding words the words, distributional vector. And I'll go through uh, some more graphic examples of, of both of these type of, of methods. Okay, so to build um, an equivalent of a words by regions matrix, as before, we have a set dimensionality, five dimensions, and we have the vocabulary here as rows, and then we observe a document, D1 here is a document, and uh, it has uh, a certain random representation, which we just uh, uh, randomly select. It has a plus one in the first dimension and a minus one in the third dimension, and the rest are zero. And then we observe uh, some words in this document. So word number one occurs one time here, 
So what we do is we add the random index vector of the document to the row for the word number one. Then word number one occurs another time in this document, we do the same thing. We add the document's random index vector to the distributional vector for word number one. And we do that as many times as the word occurs in the document. That will lead us to distributional vectors that contain words by regions type co-occurrences and it includes frequency information. So that will be an equivalent of the words by regions uh, matrix, but using considerably less dimensions. In the, in the same way, we can build uh, an approximation of a words by words matrix. So imagine that we have the vocabulary again here, and we have five dimensions. And then we observe a sequence where word number one occurs together with word number two and word number three. Word number two has a certain random index vector, which we see down there. Word number three also has a certain random index vector. And then we add both of these to the row for word number one. Okay. Now we see another co-occurrence event. Word number one occurs with, again with word number two and with word number four. So word number four doesn't have a random representation yet. We uh, generate one and then we add the random index vectors of word number two and word number four to the distributional vector for word number one, like that. And then we uh, observe a next co-occurrence event uh, with word number three and word five, and we add those vectors to the distributional vector for the word. And that will generate an equivalent of a words-by-words co-occurrence matrix using considerably less dimensions. So this is the way that uh, the random indexing methodology works. Uh, and uh, as you see there, the distributional vector is now a sum of random index vectors. And this is also true in a standard co-occurrence matrix. And the only difference here is that in a standard co-occurrence matrix, you don't use random index vectors. You have non-random symbolic vectors to update the matrix. And that will capture exactly the same information in a standard co-occurrence matrix, but using considerably less dimensions, and that makes this method very scalable and efficient. Um, and let's talk a little bit of why this works, because it might seem like a bit uh, magic that it would work with just random representations. Well, in a standard co-occurrence matrix, the contexts are orthogonal to each other, because um, they do not share any, uh, any values. The, the, each context is represented by uh, uh, its own uh, column of the matrix. But in a random index vector, when we just randomly select uh, representations, the random index vectors will be nearly orthogonal to each other. And that's sort of the key issue here. How come that when we choose random dimensions in high dimensional spaces, we arrive at near orthogonality. Well, it's simply a fact of high dimensional uh, spaces. If we choose random dimensions in these high dimensional spaces, we will approximate orthogonality. So we don't have to control for orthogonality when we generate these representations. We can do it simply at random and that will lead us to nearly orthogonal vectors, which we can then use to accumulate the distributional information, and that will lead us to an approximately uh, equivalent representation as the standard co-occurrence matrix. Um, and this is uh, uh, an example of, of how the random index vectors are really orthogonal to each other. So in the upper graph there, you see the the angle between random index vectors. Uh, and the angle is, of course, uh, it should be 90 degrees when they are orthogonal to each other. And you see that when you just have a couple of random index vectors, uh, the angle uh, fluctuates a little bit. But uh, as soon as you start to uh, generate a couple of thousand uh, random index vectors, you arrive at a very stable uh, orthogon orthogonal representations. And the, the graph below there shows the standard deviation of the angle uh, between the vectors, which is, of course, quite low 
So this is uh, just uh, to show you a proof that generating uh, random representations in high dimensional spaces will uh, generate approximately orthogonal representations with a certain set of, uh, of variance in the, in the randomness. Okay, so the underlying maths here, uh, why this works, is the same as in random prediction that we saw before. That is, we have our standard co-occurrence matrix, we can project it through a random matrix and arrive at a reduced representation, but in random indexing, we can do it without actually building the huge co-occurrence matrix. So we're avoiding the most computationally heavy step, step here. And um, the, the, w the reason why this works is something called the johnson linden strauss lemma, which uh, we're not going into details about this, but the idea is that if you have a high dimensional space that contains n number of points, uh, you can map that into a space of a much lower dimensionality in such a way that the distances between points in the original space are preserved up to a factor uh, uh, that is determinable uh, by the choice of dimensionality. Um, so, uh, what this is saying is that we can, uh, we can preserve the pairwise similarities in a high dimensional space by using this type of uh, random prediction or random indexing method up to a certain noise factor. And the noise factor is one of the parameters in selecting the proper dimensionality. Okay. And if you actually start to compute uh, uh, the type of dimensionalities that we should use uh, using this lemma, you see that for typical text data like B and C or, or the WAC data, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 dimensions are enough. And actually, this lemma is quite conservative. So we can use a couple of thousand dimensions to cover basically any size of the data. Uh, which is a very nice way of attacking the growing dimensionality problem. Uh, there are some uh, similar methods that are being used uh, in machine learning in particular. Uh, I just want to mention them because maybe you've heard about them. Uh, something called the hashing trick, which is some simply a way of dealing with high dimensional representations. And there the idea is instead of assigning random index vectors to um, items in the data stream, you simply use hash functions to compute the random uh, representations. And that's, of course, a very efficient way of doing it. You have something called locality-sensitive hashing, which is also based on the same underlying mathematics, uh, which is basically using the hashing trick to do approximate nearest neighbor searches, um, which is a nice way of speeding up these exhaustive nearest neighbor search problems. Um, and I just want to mention that hashing is a very nice um, uh, way of arriving at random representation because it's fast and it doesn't require storage of the random index vectors, but it has the disadvantage in this particular domain that we're talking about now that we can't reverse the mapping. And sometimes you actually want to get back to the random index vectors, and we'll start talking about that now. But before I, I talk about some additional refinements here, I want to uh, see if there are any questions about random indexing. So, are there any questions about uh, random indexing? Okay, there are no questions, but I can assure you that it is because you are explaining it so well that oh, I had a lot of questions, but right now you just... Uh, <laughs> Ask them all in your talk, so uh, it's just a perfect talk, that's why. Oh, oh, thank you very much. You can continue. Maybe I should stop while I'm ahead, but okay, uh, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some additional refinements of this random indexing method. One uh, thing that would be nice to have here is that when we compute the random uh, projection, we're actually use, we're losing some information about for example, word order. So imagine that we had the HAL style method where we have a directional co-occurrence matrix. If we use the random indexing methodology uh, using uh, that type of uh, co-occurrence matrix, we would lose the word order information. Uh, so we'll talk about how we can solve that and we'll talk about how we can use uh, 
the same type of method to actually retrieve syntagmatic connections. Okay, so this is something called random permutations. It's a method to encode structure in this type of distributed representation. It's, it's um, really a really general method for doing that. Um, in this particular domain, it's a method for us to encode word order in distributional semantics. And the idea is that we want to be able to do that, but we don't want to sacrifice all these uh, nice features of the random indexing, which is the scalability, the efficiency, and the performance of the models. So it needs to be fast and it needs to be scalable. And we'll see what we can do here. So just to uh, uh, explain the problem here, then uh, if we compute these distributional vectors in the random indexing way, what we get is a sum of random index vectors. And of course, word order does not matter when we're summing vectors together. So imagine that we have two sentences, the baby ate the bear and the bear ate the baby. And we want to compute the distributional representation for the word ate in these sentences we will get exactly the same representation. So word order will not affect this representation. This might not be uh, a good result, for, uh, of course. Um, so what we want is a method that will solve this problem for us. Um, there has been some suggestions in the literature of ways of doing that. And one solution that was proposed in a model called Beagle was to use uh, holographic reduced uh, representations, uh, which is based on a mathematical operation called circular convolution. Um, the Beagle model in itself accumulates distributional vectors based on n grams, up to actually 7 grams. And it uses circular convolution to bind these n-grams together. And this is quite technical, so I was not planning on actually describing this, but what we can note here is that circular convolution is a quite computationally uh, costly operation to do. It's usually implemented by using a fast Fourier transform, uh, transform which makes it a little bit more efficient, but it's still computationally heavy. So this is not really applicable to large data sets. Um, so another solution would be to simply permute vector coordinates. Uh, so using permutation, um, and here we introduce a new uh, sign here, uh, which is pi, which stands for a permutation operation. And this can be uh, basically any type of permutation. Um, what we used in our original uh, publications was simply rotation of vector coordinates, which simply means that we can rotate a vector one step to the right or one step to the left or two steps to the right or two steps to the left. And that's a very efficient uh, operation. And then uh, we can use this type of permutation operation to compute structurally sensitive distributional vectors. We can use it, first of all, to compute direction vectors, which would be equivalent to the hyperspace analog to language model. And then what we do is we rotate the random index vectors that occur to the left, one step to the left. And then we rotate random index vectors of words that occur to the right, one step to the right. So the vector, the distributional vector for the word eight in the sequence, the baby ate the bear, would be consisting of the random index vector for the rotated one step to the left, the vector for baby rotated one step to the left, and the vector for the again, but now rotated one step to the right. And the same thing for the word bear, rotated one step to the right. And this will give us directional representation. So now the vector for eight in the two sequences, the baby ate the bear and the baby, uh, the bear ate the baby, would not be equivalent anymore. They will be nearly orthogonal. Um, and uh, maybe you notice here now that using permutation will lead you to a vector that is approximately orthogonal to the original vector. So another way of actually doing this would be to um, compute different random index vectors for when a word occurs to the left and to the right. That would be completely equivalent with using permutation. 
So in that case, you would have two random index vectors for each word, when it occurs to the left and when it occurs to the right. That would be directly equivalent with this one. Mm -hmm. But if you want to um, capture word order instead, then you would need to save a possibly large number of random index vectors for each word. And then it's much more efficient to use permutation as an operation. And the way we would do it in this case is we would rotate the random index vectors to the left or to the right as many steps as the distance to the focus word. So again, we have the baby ate the bear, and we, now we rotate the word baby one step to the left, because it occurs one step to the left of eight. But the word the, we rotate it two steps to the left, because it occurs two steps to the left of eight. And then on the other direction, the occurs one step to the right, so we rotate the vector one step to the right there. And for the word bear, we rotate it two steps to the right. Okay, so this will generate order-sensitive distributional vectors. Okay? And using still the permutation operation, which is a very efficient way of binding this structure together. And uh, some results here, and this is typically quite discouraging for linguists to see, because a linguist would typically assume that, well, using word order would be much better than using just the direction of the vectors, but it's really not. And of course, this graph is not the best one because you can't really distinguish between the lines. So I will tell you what you see. You see um, for the context window, which is 1 plus 1 up to 10 plus 10, and then you see percentage of correct answers to a TOEFL synonym test, which is one of the standard evaluation types that we use in this field. And you see that the, 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 uh, the type of vectors that generate the best results are the direction vectors. So using one permutation for left and right contexts, that generates the best result on this synonym test. And using the order vectors actually generates the worst result here. And that might, of course, not be so, uh, 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 so strange, simply because of we introduce a sparse data problem when we rotated uh, the vectors uh, based on word order. So the data becomes much more sparse. And so that indicates that order vectors might actually be useful in very, very large scale data sets. Um, another thing that might be an issue here is that uh, you might wonder how much information you can actually bind into a vector before everything starts to collapse. Um, and of course this is a tangible problem, because if, if you collapse all the information uh, in the vector then you will not be able to retrieve anything. And there is a test that you can do uh, on how much information you can actually bind into a vector. It's called a paired associative memory test. And the idea then is that you, you compute uh, something called a trace vector, which uh, consists of a number of pair vectors that have been bounded together by some type of operation. So what you see there is a vector x1 and a vector y1 that we bind together using some uh, binding operation. We add it to the trace vector. We take another pair of vectors, x2 and y2, we bind them together, add it through the trace vector, and then we continue to do the same thing. And now, the problem here is that given a probe vector, x, we want to find the associative, uh, the associate vector from the set of possible random vectors, the set of y vectors. Which one was the vector that we binded it together in the trace vector? And, um, of course, the binding operation can be anything. Uh, uh, it can be, for example, circular convolution, as we saw in the Beagle met method, or we can use the permutation-based method to bind the vectors. And if we compare those two approaches here, you see this, for, this is for circular convolution. You have numbers of pairs stored in the trace, and you have retrieval accuracy. And you see that you have a pretty good retrieval accuracy for high-dimensional vectors. But the retrieval accuracy really uh, is lower for, for lower dimensional vectors. If you compare this to using random permutations, you see that the um, retrieval accuracy is better even for lower dimensional vectors. So we're actually able to bind more information using random permutations than using circular convolution.
which is nice because random permutations is also much more computationally efficient way of doing this. Um, another very uh, useful thing when we do the permutation-based uh, uh, building of the distributional vectors is that we can use the inverse permutation to extract frequent left and right neighbors to a word. Uh, that means we can actually use the distributional semantic model to work as a language model to actually predict the sequence. Um, and the way that we do that is uh, in the following way. So imagine that you have um, the sequence baby fed a large number of times in the data. And every time you observe that sequence, you would add the random index vector baby permuted one step to the left, because it occurs to the left of fed, and we add that vector to the distributional vector for fed. Okay? So the random index vector for baby permuted one step to the left, add it to the distributional vector for fed. Now, if we're interested in looking at the distributional vector for fed and seeing which words have contributed the most to this vector, so what we do is we use the inverse permutation on this vector. We permute it one step to the right, and then we compare it to all the random index vectors. So what we will see there is that this vector, the vector for fed permuted one step to the right, will be more similar to the random index vector for baby than to the other vectors. So this is a way for us to extract order-sensitive um, syntagmatic connections. Some examples of what it looks like. We have a word king and we extract frequent words before and frequent words after. Uh, you, in this uh, particular data set, which is a balanced corpus, it's the Tosa corpus, you find uh, words like become king, Martin Luther king, Dr. Martin Luther king, the French king. A word after, you have king and queen, king of England, king Midas, etc. Um, another example, the word president, you see some typical words before and after, vice president and president Roosevelt, etc. And here is an interesting thing, you see that the, the value, which are, uh, the, the numbers there are cosine similarities. So the cosine similarity for vice is much higher than the other ones, and that indicates that we're actually dealing with a collocation phenomenon here. So you can also use these, um, these syntagmatic searches to actually find the collocations. Um, okay, so we're coming to the close uh, of this talk here. Um, uh, so uh, we're not going to go through this uh, uh, thing here. I just wanted to, to demonstrate that random indexing can be defined as a completely online algorithm. You don't have to make several passes of the data. Um, uh, it simply says that you process the text one token at a time, and if you don't have a vector for the token that you're looking at, you simply generate it on the fly, and you update your distributional uh, uh, vectors. And that also means that using random indexing, you can stop the processing at any time and start using the distributional vectors. Um, you don't have to wait for things to compile. Um, there are also some, several types of optimizations that we can do when dealing with these type of models in a big data scenario. Uh, one thing that is very nice to do is to parallelize uh, the computations. And that's very straightforward to do in random indexing because the basic operation that we use is vector addition. So that's very parallelizable. There are actually also an open source implementation of a parallel uh, formulation of random indexing in the S space framework, uh, which is based on the Hadoop um, framework. Um, so if you're interested in parallel computing, you, you might uh, want to check that out and have a, have a try and use some very large data set for that because parallelization is, is not really useful if you don't have very large data. Another thing uh, that you might want to do is utilize convergency effects. Um, that is, when you train these type of models, um, the, the vectors converge quite quickly, quicker than you would expect. And so if you have 
ways of getting at convergency effects, you don't really need to update those vectors, and you don't really need to do exhaustive nearest neighbor search for those vectors. And of course, a very important point here is that forgetting is the key to a healthy mind. So if you're dealing with these type of models in a streaming scenario, just processing and not forgetting is really a bad idea. <laughs> so um, uh, forgetting is an important uh, factor in these methods. Um, and I think that actually we've come to the end of what I was planning to talk about. Uh, I think the, the time is like 12.20 or something. Uh, so maybe I should just stop talking now and see if there are any questions. Uh, any questions on, on, on this op random indexing and optimization for that? Okay, I have one. Uh, also, okay, Anani. Okay, um, we have saw that uh, from the johnson lens lesson uh, lemma, you can uh, relate the error to the similarity between uh, two words. There is some kind of uh, relation between uh, uh, the, the dimension of the vector, uh, the number of contexts, and the error rate I want to perform. Oh, sorry, it's very hard to hear. So, can you please repeat that, Piero? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, um, so, so the lemma uh, gives you an error rate uh, and it gives you uh, a way to compute the number of uh, required dimensions based on the projected error rate and the number of points but it doesn't give you anything about the number of contexts in the data. So that's not really an issue uh, here. Um, um, so, and the original formulation of the lemma is quite conservative. So if you start to compute the required dimensionality based on the original formulation of the lemma, you will see that you can really compact the space much, much uh, harder and still uh, arrive at very useful information. Um, and there have been published a large number of uh, optimizations of the lemma uh, in recent years. Uh, and it's really, an, uh, I think research is still going on uh, regarding the johnson lindon strauss lemma and exactly what the parameters are uh, for arriving at viable uh, mappings. Okay, are there uh, more questions? No, but I have one, and my question is, um, here we have, uh, for example, Pierre Paolo working on incorporating um, dependencies into uh, random indexing uh, using, for example, the vector permutation that is shown us. But do you think that incorporating like um, semantic dependencies between words, like in semantic role labeling, uh, could help uh, in some way, uh, maybe, uh, in implementing them as permutations also? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think that's a very nice approach. Um, it's simply sort of a way of saying that uh, we can do better than just using the raw co-occurrences in the data. So uh, and it really doesn't matter if we, if we restruct the context in some way based on statistics or if we use semantic role labeling or something else. It's a way of doing the context more refined. And um, I'm very happy to hear that someone is using random indexing to do, uh, to infer more uh, knowledge into the methods. So, uh, and then I have a question for you then. <laughs> so how do you evaluate the models and do you get better results? Are there any more questions? No, there are no more questions, so let's thank our speaker. Magnus, thank you really much. Thank you really much for your great and inspiring talk.
Um, I'm sure that from now on, uh, there will be someone here, some more people here working with random indexing. <laughs> thank you really much. Okay, very much. Uh, th thank you too, and uh, have a nice day, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Prova, prova, okay. um, we will start again this evening at uh, um, 14, um, two and a half p.m. with uh, a talk. The, the microphone is. And from a talk uh, from Andre Fletas, and it's also about um, distributional semantics, but for question answering. So hope to see you also in. See you later.